our moderator. Thank you, team. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank Thank you so much to Twin Cities Diversity and Practice for uh, organizing this and putting it together. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to be here. My name is Tane Danger. I, by day, am the uh, director of the Westminster Town Hall Forum uh, and have a long background in hosting public policy conversations through a theater company I started called the Theater of Public Policy. Uh, but today, you are here uh, to hear from three really incredible panelists that we have to talk through, answer questions, and try and give us a, a good grounding, this incredibly important uh, question on the Minneapolis ballot this fall. Uh, I want to say from the front end, this panel was put together purposely to be folks who are legal experts with a commitment and lots of work in their background uh, on racial justice in particular, and who are not endorsing or taking a particular uh, stance on this ballot question. Our goal for today is to try and answer questions and address some of the pros and cons of this conversation, uh, the things that are being raised uh, without uh, having it be sort of just a this side versus this side fight. We really tried to put together an incredible panel who can do that, hopefully as objectively as possible. I think we have a very good panel. I'm very excited to talk more with them. So I will do quick introductions in the email, hopefully that you got uh, and the website for this, you can read much more about them. But first up, uh, Justin Terrell is the executive director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center is a long background in criminal justice and democracy reform, both here, locally, nationally, and internationally. Hi, Justin. Uh, Josh Esme is uh, at the Legal Rights Center right now. Uh, he was previously the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the Council on Criminal or Crime and Justice. Hello, Josh. And last but certainly not least, uh, Rachel Moran is an associate professor and founder of the Criminal and Juvenile Defense Clinic at the University of St. Thomas right there in Minneapolis. Hello, Rachel. So um, we have a lot to try and talk to, and I know there's going to be lots of questions that come in. Uh, I think just considering sort of the background of where we are, I, a lot of folks, I think, can imagine you can imagine uh, are sort of like, I've been hearing a lot about this, I, I've gotten lots of pieces in the mail, and there was a long legal fight about what even this exact question that is going to be on the Minneapolis ballot this fall, how it was going to be worded and whatnot. So I thought just to get us grounded uh, in what exactly is going to be on the ballot people are going to be looking at, uh, Rachel, you agreed an offer to give us sort of just a quick rundown what the actual language is, uh, and uh, then we will be able to hopefully dig into what it all means. Thanks so much, Tane. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to take a few moments to show folks visually and talk through the actual text of the Charter Amendment. Um, I'm in my professor role right now, so bear with me as I explain this uh, so that we can all be on the same page in terms of what Minneapolitans are voting on. So right now I have displayed on the screen the text of, uh, you might hear of it as City Question 2, you might heard of it as the Charter Amendment on Policing or the Amendment to Eliminate the Minneapolis Police Department or a variety of other terms. But this is actually what we're looking at. Um, the question is, shall the Minneapolis City Charter be amended to remove the police department and replace it with the Department of Public Safety? Um, I've highlighted a couple of the text, the portions of the text that I think are particularly worth looking at, not because I'm trying to suggest a particular framing, but these are the topics that are in um, the most, uh, that people have the most questions about. So the Charter Amendment does uh, involve eliminating the police department such as, as it currently is, the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean eliminating all law enforcement. So let's look at what this says. It says replace it with a Department of Public Safety. The Department of Public Safety is uh, supposed to employ a comprehensive public health approach to safety. And then says the specific functions to be determined by the mayor and city council. And when I show you the text of the current city charter, you'll see how that's a, a potential significant change as well. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, it says it will not be subject, subject to exclusive mayoral power. And the Department of Public Safety, this is my last highlighted portion, could include licensed peace officers, parentheses, police officers, if necessary. A few important things to unpack here. Um, yes, it does remove the police department. Uh, secondly, it allows uh, shared power with, between the mayor and the city council in determining what the specific functions of the new Department of Public Safety would be. So it would no longer be exclusive mayoral power over the police department. And then third, this language could include licensed police officers if necessary. And this is where I think uh, there's been a lot of um, discussion and, and some controversy. Uh, I want to show you how this compares to the text of the current charter. So this is the current charter, and this is a this is a document I obtained from uh, Minneapolis city government. Uh, so if you look at uh, this is just a portion of the city charter 7.2. Uh, this subsection 11 is where the it currently provides for a police department in Minneapolis as part of the city charter. That provision would remove the police department from the city charter and would instead replace it with the Department of Public Safety. Um, it would also remove this language that the mayor has complete power over the establishment, maintenance, and command of the police department. That's potentially significant because as the uh, police department is currently structured, the mayor is, this is the current language that would be removed if the amendment passes. So currently the mayor does have complete power over the command of the police department. That language would be eliminated so that the power would be shared between the mayor and city council. Um, this language isn't that pertinent. It just discusses the appointment of the police chief, but this language, it would all be removed. There would not be a Minneapolis police chief because there would not be a Minneapolis police department. But of course, there still would be a Department of Public Safety. Um, if you look down here at what I've highlighted with funding, um, you'll remember in the charter amendment, it says include licensed police officers if necessary. Currently, the way the Minneapolis charter is structured is that the city is required to fund a police force, a minimum number of police officers. That requirement would be eliminated. It doesn't mean that the city can't fund a minimum number of peace officers. In fact, it also doesn't impose a cap on the maximum number of peace officers or the maximum amount of funding. So in theory, if this amendment passes, there could be just as many peace officers, there could be even more peace officers, or there could be fewer. What the amendment definitively does is remove the minimum funding amount. And then here is the text. Uh, that whole section would be eliminated that we, you just saw the black lines through. And here's the new text. You see it's much shorter, um, but it does include that the same text of the charter amendment that you saw earlier, including licensed peace officers if necessary, indicating that the mayor would nominate a commissioner of the Department of Public Safety and the city council would appoint that person. And then lastly, I just want to point out one more thing. This is a separate Minnesota state statute, but some folks have um, talked about this statute as it relates to the charter amendment. There is a Minnesota state statute that says charter amendments, uh, if passed, shall take effect in 30 days from the date of the election. And we could have a whole conversation if folks have questions about that. What does it mean for something to take effect? Some people believe that uh, law enforcement would cease to exist within 30 days of the date of the election. I will tell you that the Minneapolis city clerk is saying that is not the case and that what would need to happen is um, the amendment would need to be in process of taking effect. So they would perhaps appoint an interim commissioner of public safety and begin a much longer process of determining what public safety would look like and what peace officers would look like. But I do want to point out, this is the language that has some folks um, talking about what it would mean for this amendment to take effect within 30 days. And just to press on that point for a moment, is there, a, 
if it's not, it, it needs to get started within 30 days. Is there a time limit? Could the process unfold over another six months, another year, another two years? Do we have any rules about that? There's not a time limit by law. Uh, the city clerk, and again, this is just the person who's been authorized to speak on behalf of the city. So uh, take that for what it's worth. But the city clerk has indicated that the process would likely last at least six months or more for the mayor and city council to begin. Um, the city clerk has indicated that the appointment of an interim commissioner would likely happen within those 30 days, but then the process of determining what public safety, what the division would look like, how it would be staffed would be a much longer process, likely at least six months. And then one other uh, just textual question, then I promise we're going to go to Justin and Josh uh, for more pieces here, but you made an a important point about uh, there is not within this new potential uh, public safety commission uh, a fixed number of you have to have this many officers or you can only have this many. It's very open that way. But one of the pieces you do hear is people debating whether or not it is the point of it is to get to zero officers. And then you hear some people say, well, there's actually state statute that would say you can't get to that. Is that true? Is there Minnesota state statute that would require that there are at least some police officers involved or is that unclear? Well, Minneapolis would still have a responsibility for the public safety of its residents, which almost certainly would include law enforcement services of some sort. Um, it's not clear what that would exactly be, but, uh, and I can't cite the state statute number to you off the top of my head, but yes, they would be required to provide law enforcement services for their own municipality. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, that was a very helpful uh, grounding exercise. I would take your class any day. Uh, yes, Josh, do you want to jump in before I ask uh, the next question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that was a really good summary of um, what ballot question two does. Um, and I guess I would just sort of highlight, um, although I think, you know, Rachel made it clear that what it doesn't do is um, vote on what the policy of the city would be in terms of delivering law enforcement services going forward. Um, this is very much a, you know, a structural change to the charter that would affect the process of how policy decisions are made going forward. Um, I think it does that in a way that shifts more policy making or sort of legislative power to the city council which you know people can have different opinions about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing i will say that shifts it much more in line with what we usually think of in terms of you know uh, an executive branch and a legislative uh, branch like we'd see in the state constitution or the federal constitution um and it does you know it does sort of remove some i guess um you sort of unique uh, aspects for how Minneapolis's uh, government structure was set up compared to, you know, other institutions like the state, the federal government, and other major cities. Okay, that is, uh, thank you for that context. And I want, we obviously want to dig into this more. I do really want to take a moment to just sort of ask a big picture question of how did we get here? Obviously, as uh, we even said in the sort of promotional things about this conversation, you know, we're, we're a year and a few months out from the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, and the issues and complaints with the Minneapolis Police Department did not begin uh, there. Uh, they are longstanding. And so, uh, Justin, if I can come to you actually on this piece, one thing I've heard folks say is, yes, this is uh, an extraordinary measure. It's something that there are very few examples of other cities doing. And yet Minneapolis also has an extraordinary problem here. And I'm curious if you could speak to whether uh, Minneapolis's police department and the way that it's been structured and run over the years is uniquely broken or, or problematic, or uh, if that's you know, maybe it is a, a symptom of something much larger that we see in other ways all over the country, or both. Thanks, Tane. I appreciate the question. Um, I think so. We have 150 years of policing in the state of Minnesota in Minneapolis, 
And the reality is since day one, we have had experiences with this with law enforcement in this state that um, are racist, that are misogynist, that don't provide you know uh, safety for people, um, that allow certain communities to be targeted and to live with high rates of crime. Um, and the authority we give to law enforcement actually can reinforce that uh, level of high rates of crime in, in different ways. I think that we are looking at a much bigger problem um, and you know it stems from a couple of things. One, we ref uh, law enforcement refused to reckon with their history. You know, with lynchings in Duluth, where the current uh, uh, chief of police in Duluth is the is the great nephew of the woman who accused Clayton Jackson and McGee of rape falsely and had them lynched by an opera crowd while the sheriff stood by and provided weapons for people. Um, we have sundown towns in this state where people, uh, where black folks couldn't be outside after sundown, otherwise they would be harmed in, by violence. Um, we have a long history of policy receipts at the state capitol and city local uh, governments, county and city governments, of policies that looked the other way while black communities that were thriving and being built were bulldozed for highways and at the same time investments made for white communities like Roseville. I think that we have a long history um, in this state uh, that has gotten us to where we are. There's an old African proverb I like to rely on that says, don't look where you landed, look where you slipped. And even in the aftermath of George Floyd, um, you know, most just recently, we, I mean, during the uprising, we saw how Jalil Sterling, a black man who was out defending, I believe he was out defending a business um, in, a, in a group, was hunted down by the Minneapolis SWAT team. Uh, shot with uh, rubber bullets. He fired back at the officers when was the, and then once he recognized there were officers surrendered and they assaulted him while he was on the ground and helpless while he screamed, sir, sir, listen, please, right? This is the, this is the law enforcement that we have today. And we got here because, you know, law enforcement to their credit is really responsive to the desires and needs of the community. So back in the day when we had law enforcement, um, they were just as liberal as all the other unions and 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 um, and and whatnot. And then, you know, when we have the uh, you know rise of sort of corporate interests, we see a co-opt, co uh, seeing them being co-opted. And then from there, you get the war on drugs, and you get you know the war on terrorism. Every time the every time society has said we want officers to show up a certain way to respond, and they do that. Unfortunately, the way we've been asking them to show up is with more violence, uh, more sort of like action hero mentality. And what we need today is uh, we need guardians instead of warriors. And that is a difficult shift for the profession to make. I believe it needs to make it. I believe that there's things in place that will help make it. Frankly, I believe that this amendment puts enough pressure on the, on the profession to do the analysis of where they've been and where they wanna go. And if they don't do that analysis, you know, there's plenty of organizers out there who are lined up to abolish the police. So thank you for that. Um, that was a lot of uh, painful history in a very uh, concise amount of time. I, I've i talked to uh, folks uh, on various sides of this debate, both in sort of public conversations like this and in personal conversations. I don't meet many people, if anyone, who doesn't believe that reform is absolutely necessary. And so the questions become how and what kinds of reforms. So one of the very key questions that keeps coming up for me and I think others is this ballot measure, what are the reforms specifically that it would allow that we could not do as a city without though this ballot measure passing? If this passes, we can do X, Y, and Z, that if it doesn't pass, that's just off the table. Josh, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, well, not a ton, actually, um, because, you know, like we were saying before, mostly what it does is change the structure of how those policy changes come about and who's responsible and who has the power within city government to do that. And so... Um, you know, as it is set up right now, the city charter has a specific barricade that prevents the city council from legislating in the area of uh, police policy. And, you know, this is something that has, has come up when I was prepping for this a little bit. I was talking to the former executive director here at Legal Rights Center, Michael Friedman, who used to serve 
um, with Justin on the Citizen uh, Review Authority. And, you know, he had this anecdote about sort of the early days of the tasers being rolled out and uh, the CRA getting a bunch of complaints about officers who had access to the sort of small test batch of tasers that were using them not as a defense tool, but as a compliance tool, right? Do what I say or get tased. And that was leading to complaints. So the community didn't like that for obvious reasons. Um, and so there was some pushback uh, about, you know, uh, trying to get the, the police department to adopt a new sort of use policy for those tasers. Um, and they brought it to um, the city council. The city council can't do that. City council doesn't have the authority to require the police department um, to adopt a new use of, of force policy with respect to the tasers. The one thing they could do, though, um, the only area of policy sort of making um, influence they have currently over the police department is with funding. And so city council said, either you adopt, you know, the, the use of force policies that the CRA is recommending, or we're not buying you your tasers. So that seemed like a good solution. That worked. They adopted the policy. And then here at Legal Rights Center, where, you know, day in and day out, we represent clients, you know, charged with, with criminal crimes here in Hennepin County. About a year and a half later, we got a case that came through. The client was charged with obstructing legal process, which is what people usually get charged with when the cops use force on them. Uh, and it really sort of looked like the, the, the fact pattern here was an officer using the taser in a, you know, sort of compliance uh, method. And we, through our discovery, one of our attorneys got, you know, demanded that the, the police department produce the current use of force policy. And lo and behold, it had reverted back uh, to what it was before city council had bought their tasers. And so it's just a good example of, you know, how city council's hands are tied. And I think how this um, policy came or this, this ballot initiative came about in the first place was, you know, a lot of pressure put on, on city council to make changes in the, the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And them just not being able to make policy changes under the, the current structure. So again, all this really does is give city council the, po the power to, to start making some of those policy changes. In addition with, you know, I think, I think the largely symbolic though important um, sort of affirmation of the community's desire to have a, uh, you know, comprehensive public health based department of um, public safety. Uh, but just so I'm not ignoring the actual framework of the question, I think my answer is it doesn't do much in terms of, of those, those policies. The one thing it does do, though, is it removes that basically constitutional or city charter requirements that there be a minimum of police officers. So the city could go below that after this is, uh, if, it, if this were to be passed, although there's no telling if they would. And well, we got a question in the Q&A, which seems fitting for right now. This is also my plug for folks. If you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A and I'll bring them to the panelists. But someone asks, uh, if policy is not being voted on, could the new Department of Public Safety end up looking identical to the current police department, typically, uh, technically, uh, or in practice? Um, it's just the exact same department with a new name. Justin, Rachel, Justin's nodding. Yeah, I think that's a that's a that is a proper analysis. We could just be changing the stickers. And if I'm just being transparent, you know, the the whole point of this amendment is that the if you look at the vote yes table and the folks who are organizing the amendment, they want to see zero police. Like their Black Visions Collective is clear that they believe in abolition. If you're not if you're not educated on ab abolition, if you want to learn more about it, read Miriam Kaba. You know, um, I would say um, if you're not interested in abolition, read, you know, Danielle Charette's Until We Reckon. Um, she's not advocating for abolition, but she talks about some transformative ideas. And the idea that the, what I struggle with is like changing, changing the stickers on the department isn't enough. So we will get the same kind of policing we've always gotten. And then organizers will be upset and they will push to advocate to abolish the police. And I think that's the setup that we're currently looking at. Um, I will say this, that um, as a black man who grew up in Minneapolis, who has been assaulted by law enforcement, who has experienced, you know, firsthand uh, the failures of the way we do policing in the city, uh, that I'm not an abolitionist, that I, I believe that, you know, we need, this could, this needs to be a transformative moment where law enforcement as a profession re responds to the pressure that's been put upon it. 
Um, and I think that, and so for that reason, I, th I think that the amendment serves a purpose, right? To, to put that pressure on law enforcement. And they and this, our city leaders have a decision to make about how they wanna go forward. There's very little faith in the fact that, um, you know, we have passed uh, no less than 15, maybe 20 policies at the state level uh, uh, that address uh, reform for police. And, and, this, and it, it's all good stuff, stuff that we should have passed 20 years ago that probably would have kept us out of this situation. Um, but at the end of the day, if the profession does not reckon with its own history, does not adopt a new vision going forward, we're, we're in for a couple years of chaos here. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Um, I completely agree with Justin's answer and what Josh has said in terms of what uh, the symbolic meaning of this amendment, but also the practical meaning and, you know, to the question that was posed about whether a new Department of Public Safety could look similar. Yes, except for the minimum funding requirement. Um, everything else could potentially look so similar. And even, like I said at the beginning, you could even end up with more law enforcement. There's no maximum funding requirement. I also just wanted to jump in a little bit as to the person um, who posed the question about, uh, I, I alluded to state law earlier that would probably prevent a complete elimination of law enforcement or public safety services. Um, Tane, thanks for posting uh, one of the statutes that applies. So Minnesota state statute does require, um, and for folks who haven't seen this, Tane did post an answer in the uh, Q&A about this. It does require emergency response services available through a 911 system and says they must include police services. Um, now that issue hasn't really uh, come up in Minnesota before, but it does, that statute seems to indicate that police services must be provided in some way, um, at least in emergency response setting. There are also state statutes that limit who can do what in terms of public safety. And so some folks would say that a state statute saying, for example, only a licensed peace officer can uh, make most arrests that means that, well, you have to have peace officers because it's hard to envision a city where no arrests would ever happen. Now, I'm, I'm totally in agreement that these things are up for debate, but I did want to answer the question about what statutes folks are thinking about when they are saying that state law requires some sort of law enforcement or public safety services. And then the last thing I'd point out, which is also part of this discussion about whether Minneapolis could truly eliminate um, peace officers is the uh, current police union contract. Some folks may know a lot about this, some folks may not, but uh, Minneapolis has not had a um, updated police union contract since December of 2019. The city and the police department have been in an absolute stalemate for quite a while about this, but the union contract is still in effect until a new one is reached and it makes it extremely difficult to terminate officers. So um, I don't think anyone has fully resolved the question of how does that union contract continue to play out if the police department is eliminated, but the folks who are employees of the police department would certainly have arguments to make that that uh, union contract prevents Minneapolis from terminating them. Uh, we're getting some questions actually in the chat that mirror things that I've wondered about as well. We've talked about there's practical or uh, policy aspects of this question. And then, you know, there are symbolic aspects of it. And I don't use symbolic as sort of a, a throwaway, oh, it's just symbolic. I think that that's actually very important in what voters are signaling and saying that they want. But there's a question here in uh, what this is potentially signaling or saying to police officers. And so Sarah is asking, uh, she hears from folks who are unsure about voting yes, uh, if folks, uh, if police, uh, she hears from people who are unsure about voting yes, that they're worried that then police officers who we are, will uh, resign in mass uh, as sort of a protest uh, to uh, abolishing the police department this way and replacing it with this new piece. Um, uh, she she's wondering if there are police officers who are for this amendment uh, and i'm also wondering sort of as a tag on to that if we were to pass this amendment as a city 
would we be asking all of the current police officers or whatever number of them was decided upon, would that be the pool that we would be largely drawing from in order to build this new department? This kind of goes back to that question of, is it possible we are changing the sticker on this by taking the same pool of police officers and putting a new name on them? So that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is whether we hear from police officers who actually are very much in favor of this amendment. Uh, Justin, Josh, do either of you want to jump in on either piece of this? Um, I can start and maybe Justin can can pick up. Um, you know, I think the the basic answer to the question of, you know, who, which police officers would make the transition to the Department of Public Safety is we don't know. Again, that's, you know, that's one of those those sort of policy considerations that would have to be um, hashed out uh, if the ballot question was passed. I think, you know, to Rachel's point that there are contractual concerns in play here, I think that would probably make it pretty likely that that is a similar pool. Um, I, you know, I don't think I'm in a position to speak on behalf of any, you know, of the police officers about how they feel about the symbolic um, message were the voters to pass ballot question to. Um, but I guess, you know, one thing I would say is just sort of nationally, there's been a fair amount of noise from some of the police unions and, and about uh, pushback on, you know, vaccine requirements and things like that. And, you know, threats uh, to resign in mass over some of those requirements that, you know, just some kind of following those stories and the headlines seems like that was a lot of bluster and not much follow through from people. You know, when it, when it really comes down to, are you giving up your career that you've invested your life in? Um, you know, I'm not sure you know, it seems to me unlikely that we would lose the entire Minneapolis Police Department, um, but that's just my view on it. What do you think, Justin? Well, I mean, we're already losing a lot of them. Um, I think there's four police officers patrolling the north side at midnight. Um, and, and so the attrition is already taking place. There's tons of lawsuits. People are, you know, I grew up in Minneapolis and some of my homeboys are have joined um, MPD and are currently out on PTSD after the third precinct was burnt down, and and um and you know they were stationed at the third precinct. I mean, the there's a, you know there's a lot of officers who have already left the force, and I believe that um, passing the the amendment, you know, it's very reasonable to expect more officers to leave. They there's folks leaving force every week. Um, I I don't I'm not that's not to say that I think. You know, once again, we're, my organization is neutral on the amendment, um, uh, but I think that that's more of a reflection of the profession and where the profession is at, and its and, and its unwillingness to to reckon with what's been what's what's gotten them into this situation. You know, um, I also sit on the post board, and I and today even I have a meeting with officers at two o'clock. You know, and the they're very the officers are very demoralized right now. It's very low morale. And there are people who show up every day to protect the community, every day trying to invest in these in, in our communities who want to do the right thing and they feel like they can't do the right thing, that everything they do is wrong. And I tend to agree with that analysis. I think that the way law enforcement is set up from the jump is set up for failure. And um, when you fail to, uh, I keep using the term reckon, but when you fail to, to address the fact that your profession was set up largely in a way to control black bodies and and female bodies and non gender conforming bodies. <laughs> and when you when your profession is set up in a way that uh, those populations that you should be serving have been the target, and you refuse to reckon with that, then yeah, I bet it is demoralizing. I will just plug our work at the post board real quick. Um, you know, you asked the question about reforms earlier, and I would just say that. Uh, just given the current political climate in Minneapolis, you know, I'm not optimistic about the mayor's ability to pass reforms, right? They haven't, you know, technically these officers in the Sterling case have broken the state statute, have broken law on how they treated Sterling. And and we didn't see any charges against officers. In fact, Jalil Sterling was charged and acquitted. And so we, we just see failure upon failure in how the system in Minneapolis is operating right now. 
But at the state, at the post board, we're in the process of overhauling the entire standard of conduct for every officer in the state of Minnesota. Sort of there was a dirt floor with very low minimum, no standards there. And now we're pouring concrete on it. And it's being done in collaboration with law enforcement and community members. Some of the more, more active community members in the, in, in the movement, like Michelle Gross and, and, and Dr. Raj are at the table helping develop these standards. And so I do think there's hope. Um, I think the mess in Minneapolis is just that. It's kind of a mess. Um, uh, and and I, you know, I challenge either side to help me understand as a black man in this community, uh, you know, how, how are they serving our interests? Because if you watch the debate between Reverend McAfee and Janae Bates last night, what you see is two brilliant black leaders who should be working together to address a police problem because the problem is law enforcement's problem. It is not a black problem. But what you should be seeing is these kind of folks coming together to work on a solution that works for everyone. And instead what we have is polarized, um, a polarized issue that really shouldn't be one. And I thank you for that. And Josh, I see your hand, I'm gonna to come to you, but just to make perfectly clear for the audience watching, Justin, those reforms, that good work that you're talking about, that was happening on a state level. And so you're contrasting that with sort of the way that the conversation right now you feel like is playing out in Minneapolis. Absolutely, because there's no reason that kind of work can be happening at the city level either. But what you see is a failure of folks to work together, come, across, come together across differences, keep the main thing the main thing, focus on shared values, the fact that everyone wants to feel safe. And right now in our community, and forgive me, because I do get a little upset about this, because you know I have a young, I mentor a young man who lives on the north side, and eleven of his friends were shot within months of George Floyd's murder. And so, you know, this has real time ex impact in my household. I'm sure many of the people on this call have the same experience um, or similar experience. And so what you see is just a failure of people willing to work together for the betterment of the community. And when you look at the money pouring into this debate that we're having, it's clear that people are more interested in a debate and are funding a debate as opposed to funding a real solution. And that is a missed opportunity, especially when you consider the brilliant organizers on the vote yes side, some of the best organizers in the country and when you consider the, the intentions of some of the folks on the vote no side, there is just no reason this should be a polarized debate, in my opinion. People should come together and do the work that we're similar to what we're doing at the Post Board, which is a, is a state licensing body for every police officer in the state of Minnesota, where we're changing the standards so that misconduct will can result in the officer losing their license. That gets around the union, that gets around arbitration, if you lose your license, you can't be a cop. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. And those kind of accountability measures is what we need. Thank you. Josh, you had your hand up a moment ago. Well, I just I wanted to respond to something that Justin said that I thought was really interesting. And it's maybe um, think back to one of his earlier comments uh, that I could not possibly agree with more, which is that we need guardians, not warriors. Um, and, you know, the idea you know, Justin mentioned that we are already losing um, uh, police officers, uh, and it sounded like, you know, what he was describing there was a lot of officers who just feel like they can't do the job the way that they want to do the job in the current system um, and are leaving because of that. You know, to me, that sounds like there are a lot of police officers in the city that want this change just as much as, you know, people in the community do. And that's pretty different than I, what I think the crux of the question was, which is, at least as I understood it, which was more of the threat that people, um, you know, police officers will quit because they oppose the change and get the wrong message um, from, uh, you know, from, from ballot question to uh, where it to be, where it to be passed. And so I just think that's sort of an interesting dynamic and shows, uh, you know, that, you know, maybe if you just look at the rhetoric coming from some of the police union heads, it seems like, you know, they're kind of a, a solid, you know, solid uh, block of interests there. But, it, you know, if you really break it down and start talking to individual officers, I think you probably see there's just as much disagreement within that pool of people as there is in the, you know, the general community. Uh, Rachel, there's an area of this that we haven't gotten into uh, as much that is like a very practical change that this uh, amendment would do, which is the leadership, uh, even above whether it's the police chief or a new public safety commissioner. 
Uh, this would change, in theory, from a mayoral sort of uh, uni unitary control of the police department to one where the city council has uh, more say, more legislative authority over the department. Can you talk at all about what that change actually looks like or if there are sort of places, other communities and places that we can look at and say like, oh, it would look more like this and less like what we have now? Sure. Um, and I'll jump in on what Justin and Josh were just talking about, too, which is the one person who has, in terms of the police department, who has taken a vocal stance on this uh, is Chief Arredondo. And he has said, at least uh, the position he has taken in the public thus far, is that he would not remain, uh, he would not be interested in continuing in leadership if the department were eliminated. Um, but I absolutely agree. It, it, you know, it's tempting to think of police officers as some monolith who all have the same opinions, and that's dramatically incorrect. Um, so I also, I just want to say, I also can't speak for individual police officers at all, but there is one person who has spoken up about this, and it's Chief Arredondo, and he has said he's not interested in continuing in leadership if his department is eliminated. In terms of how, what leadership would look like moving forward, um, we don't have a sense of who the commissioner of public safety would be. At least there's not, there not, no one has made any public statements about that. There may be, um, I imagine there are front runners below the surface. Um, the mayor and the city council would be, uh, the amendment indicates that they would be working in conjunction with each other. Um, I know we're getting a lot of questions in the chat about what is the practical effect of this? Well, uh, we don't, this is another one where I can't say exactly. We don't know exactly what that means. We know that the mayor is supposed to appoint this uh, commissioner and that the city council, or propose the commissioner and the city council will appoint uh, that person. Uh, we know that the city council is supposed to work with the mayor in determining what the specific functions of the new Department of Public Safety would be precisely how they would work together, the amendment can't speak to that or doesn't speak to that. And um, that's, you know, that's another point of tension perhaps for some folks. We, we know that the mayor and city council have been at odds in a number of issues, particularly issues related to law enforcement. I will say that, and this is, speaks again to Justin's uh, frustration, we have, the current mayor um, has been widely criticized for not disciplining or terminating officers who have been uh, involved in misconduct or who were involved in misconduct in the aftermath of Mr. Floyd's murder or who, for example, treated protesters badly or who shot at J Jaleel Stallings. Um, those folks have not been disciplined, although some have resigned. The mayor has pushed back and said, he can't uh, speak up about ongoing investigations and he can't do anything about people who leave the department voluntarily. And so uh, there's, uh, there's, there are a number of folks who think the mayor has been ineffective in ensuring accountability. And then there are other supporters who say, well, it's not that simple. Um, but, it, but to the practical effect of how they would work together, we don't, the amendment does not answer that question. Well, and to that, I mean, that accountability point is a huge element of this. And so maybe I will bring it to Josh and Justin. I, I feel like in a lot of these questions, we're kind of getting to, it depends, right? Like, and the very good legal answer, right? Like, it depends on exactly how this rolls out. But what can we say about if this were to pass, how uh, disciplining uh, officers uh, accused of wrongdoing might change? Do we have a sense of whether that would work differently? Justin, you're kind of making a face or? No, we don't, ha we don't have a sense of it. I mean, there's no, that's not part of the ballot question or the, or the changes, right, in the, in that, that are being proposed. It's like the central issue that is not being talked about. Now, I'm, I've heard uh, a summary sort of secondhand uh, and I've read in the strip a little bit about what the mayor's plan is for police accountability going forward. And it sounds a lot like the plan that is currently failing right now. The, the reality is that we need to have a much bigger conversation about law enforcement. Um, we need to shrink 
the the footprint of law enforcement so that they are no longer responding to things that don't require a badge and a gun. You know, over time we have, and this is a principle of transformative justice, once again, thinking about Miriam Kaba and others out of the Oakland area who've spent a lot of time on this. Um, <clears throat> the idea that we have to get clear on like, when do we need a badge and a gun? And when do we need something else? And so over time, people have advocated responsibility to law enforcement saying, and I think it kind of goes back to that co-optation of by corporate interests, you know, saying there's homelessness in front of my business. We need police to deal with that, right? There is mental health issues in our society. We need police to deal with that. And and we've, we've put a badge and a gun in a whole lot of situations that don't require a badge and a gun. But in the process of doing that, we haven't developed, we also haven't developed the governing structures needed to adopt the public health model in response to those other things. And so if you, the, the real work that needs to be done is whoever's in charge of the city after this election, we need to start focusing on shrinking the footprint of law enforcement. That's not about numbers of officers, that's about the duties of officers. Then we need to develop new governance systems for that respond to the issues that we don't that we no longer want officers to address, like mental health, homelessness, uh, uh, drug addiction, and those things. And that is a that is a big transformative process that we are not spending nearly enough time talking about while we're debating over over a charter amendment that you know is basically a setup for organizers to try to abolish the police. And on the other end, it's a setup for uh, corporate interests to make sure that they have officers protecting their businesses. And it's, and it, and I just don't see where it serves the community when what we need to be talking about is something so much bigger. And the failure of leadership um, to, to really get folks invested in that larger vision and start doing that work is incredible. <laughs> uh, oh, I, uh... Josh, I, I see you. I, I, I have a question here that I think kind of dovetails with this, so I'll give you a chance to respond to Justin. But also, and I see, Rachel, you want to answer this as well. Someone in the chat is asking, do we have a sense of what other duties the Department of Public Safety commissioner would be responsible for? Would they be responsible for COVID policy overlap with Hennepin County? And I think, do we know that the responsibilities of this new position and also department that are potentially Actually, beyond just the uh, traditional police public safety role that we think about maybe now. Josh, I'll start with you and then go to Rachel. Um, sure. And I'll, and I'll try to, you know, answer that. And I think I can answer that and, and, and build on what Justin was saying at the same time. And, you know, we sound like a broken record here, but no, <laughs> we don't. Uh, because, again, the only thing that, you know, ballot question two does is uh, sort of reorganize how the charter uh, divvies out those policy policy making powers between the mayor and the city council. And so, you know, what Justin was just describing in terms of a policy vision for how these public safety services would be delivered in the city of Minneapolis is just absolutely spot on. If that is something that, in, in my humble opinion, and so to our audience, uh, if that is something that you're interested in, you know, what ballot question two does is say, okay, well now in order to go and try to make that happen, do you want to have that entirely run through the mayor who right now has sole policymaking authority for the police department? Or do you want to give city council legislative policymaking power so that they, you know, that they could enact ordinances uh, that bring that about? Whichever way you go on that decision, uh, this the vote on this doesn't get you there. And so the, the, the next message is, okay, well, you need to vote for a mayor who will get you there. You need to elect city council members that will get you there. This is absolutely the like bare minimum start of a conversation. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't vote on this and you're going to get what you want. It's vote on this and then continue to advocate and continue to advocate, uh, you know, and push your electeds um, uh, to deliver the policy that you, that you want. Rachel? Thanks, and I'll just um, share my screen one more time to compliment Josh's answer that we don't know what this person would do. Um, you can see this text here again, the Department of Public Safety is responsible for integrating public safety functions into a comprehensive public health approach to safety. 
Well, that's as far as this amendment gets in answering the question of what does the commissioner do? What kinds of, what does a comprehensive public uh, health approach mean? We can't answer that. This amendment doesn't answer that question. Um, all it says is that the mayor and the city council are responsible for determining the specific functions. So I think it's possible that the uh, commissioner of public safety could have a much broader role um, uh, in, on public health issues like COVID policies, perhaps. But that's something for the mayor and the city council to work out if the amendment passes. It's not answered by the amendment itself. So I have two last areas that I want to talk about. Uh, one is a little more technical and one is big picture, but we've only got about five minutes or so. So I, I'm hoping we can do particularly this first one briefly. And it may be another, we don't know. But uh, the question is the funding piece, which is another uh, debate or conversation we hear. A lot of the things, to be frank, it's to me sound like we're talking about needing to uh, either increase funding or move funding around in some dramatic ways to increase sort of the types of services, the ways that we are responding to different issues in the community. Uh, and that requires dollars, whether you take those dollars from current department and uh, police officers or whether you increase funding. Uh, the question is, do we know what, how that funding mechanism, how this would actually be funded uh, and paid for to do this work that we are talking about going forward. Rachel, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we don't know. The amendment definitely does not answer that question of how funding would work moving forward. Uh, I do want to just share one quick example. Some folks have um, asked the question, are there other cities that have tried to eliminate their police department or done anything remotely similar. Some folks may remember that the Camden, New Jersey Police Department got quite a bit of attention at, uh, shortly after George Floyd's murder. Uh, it suddenly, media started reporting that Camden had done something similar. Camden really didn't do something similar at all. It's very different. But the one thing I will say about what happened in Camden is that um, they did eliminate their police department in favor of a countywide system. Um, they ended up with a similar um, funding capacity, but they hired, they actually hired more law enforcement at lower salaries and provided increased law enforcement services. So Camden, Camden is a wildly different model. I just wanted to point that out because there's still a misperception that they are the most similar city to have done something like what Minneapolis is proposing. It's really very, very different. But um, the one comparison point is that uh, when you look at the way they chose to alter their funding structure, they found funding from a different entity altogether, which is the county. That's not what is being proposed in Minneapolis. So we're still looking at um, whatever the whatever peace officer services may be provided in Minneapolis, funding would still have to come from the city itself, not from an outside source. We are short on time, but Joss or Justin, do you have anything you would want to add to that briefly? No, I think she nailed it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, you know, Milwaukee is a city that has plenty of issues with policing and racial inequities. Um, but they have uh, a, their civilian oversight body actually is in charge of the the budget of the police and fire department. Um, they also are the ones, a civilian body that hires the chief of both departments, fires the chief of both departments. And um, it, it, it's not a perfect model by any means, but it's a, in my opinion, it's a model worth interrogating and investigating. And it's something that we, at the Minnesota Justice Research Center that we're looking into because we're really curious about how do you reimagine policing? And um, shameless plug, uh, November 16th and 17th, we are having our Reimagining Justice, our third Reimagining Justice Conference where you can hear from award-winning author Danielle Sered of the book Until We Reckon. She's also the executive director of Common Justice. And uh, Attorney G General Keith Ellison is going to provide an analysis of accountability and what that looks like in the system as well. So I invite folks to engage in more conversations like that. Avoid these pointless debates uh, that, that don't seem to make anyone happy. And let's find a way to you know, be a Minnesota that works together towards a vision that can be an example to the world as opposed to being this embarrassing, terrible, tragic story that we've had over the last year and a half. So, 
So that is a, a beautiful segue into what my last question is. And I'll come to you last, Justin, since that was already you. That was a beautiful uh, sentiment already. And I'll give you a chance to think about the next beautiful sentiment. Uh, but whatever, whether this passes or not, there is going to be incredible work that needs to be done going forward. And considering what brought us here today and uh, the organization that has us here, Twin Cities Diversity in Practice, my last question for each of you, and I'll go Josh, Rachel, Justin, how do we make, make sure that racial justice is actually at the heart of that conversation going forward and the work that needs to be done, again, in reforming this uh, question of public safety, whether or not this amendment passes? Josh? You know, I I would just sort of come back to my experience working with my clients over a decade, representing them in, you know, criminal court here in, in St. Paul and, and Minneapolis. Um, and, you know, one of the sort of areas that I've gotten to work on quite a bit is on what are called the collateral consequences. And so these are the impacts of having contact, uh, often unnecessary contact with law enforcement that ends ends up putting you in the system. And it happens more if you are, you know, uh, in particular uh, racial and economic demographics than if you're in others. And if you live in certain parts of the city or if you live in the suburbs or elsewhere. And I just think it's important to highlight that, you know, in the Twin Cities, we have huge problems with racial disparities in lots of areas of life, um, you know, whether it's unemployment, housing, education, health, and, and certainly criminal justice. And I just want to sort of highlight that what happens in the criminal justice system with these collateral consequences, you end up with a record, that record ends up negatively impacting your ability to be successful in all of those other areas that we're also concerned about. So, um, you know, to me, whether or not ballot question two passes, uh, we just have to, you know, keep hammering on that until we fix it. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Josh. Rachel, uh, how do we make sure that this stays, this stays about racial justice? Well, I don't, I'll just keep it really quick since we have no time left. I am a white woman, uh, so I'm particularly speaking to the other white folks listening in on this. Um, I, I, have not, I am not the demographic that has been most affected by problematic policing. And so my opinion doesn't matter as much as listening to the folks who are most affected and elevating their voices. So that's something we can do when we think about how to vote on this amendment. And it's something we can do when we think about how to change policing moving forward. Justin? I'll just, yep, I'll just briefly just co-sign on what Rachel is saying, is that you got to listen to the people who are directly impacted. The people closest to the pain are closest to the solution. And we talk about racial equity in this state and we never are able to center the, the the general community that is mostly impacted by it and our failure to reckon what's been done is impeding our ability to 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 vision what is possible and the way that you get there is by centering the folks who are living the nightmare that we're trying to solve well, on that note, thank you, uh, everybody, wherever you are, uh, please, a round of applause for this uh, panel for uh, sharing their wisdom and their insights and their expertise with us today. Thank you so much to Twin Cities Diversity and Practice for hosting this. And right now, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Sumra, who uh, is uh, going to close us out. Yep. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Thank you to Tane for serving as our moderator. Thank you to like Rachel, Justin, and Josh. Um, this was for me a really insightful and thoughtful, um, you know, like discussion about a really hot button topic right now. And that's precisely what the Wanton Injustice Legal Detail is about. We are here to talk about what is impacting our local Twin Cities legal community and our communities at large. Um, and as you see on the screen, the second CLE code word is safety. So that's the code word you'll need for the post-event survey if you're interested in CLE credits. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn if you're interested in hearing about more of our events and programs. But thank you to all of our panelists and to our moderator. And thank you for joining us this, this morning. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>